But as an artist, when you paint, you're also thinking, how is my audience absorbing this painting? And so in the same way, when you create copy or create any sort of uh, website or collateral, you have to think now, how is your audience absorbing this? What is the user experience? How do they go through all of these pieces and synthesize it in their head? And at the end of the day, what is the message that they're left with? Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Smarter Money Show. My name is Vlad Sherbatov, and today on the show, we have a very special guest. She is a very accomplished marketer and entrepreneur. She has spent the past 15 years helping companies grow with her innovative approach to marketing strategy. And she's helped lots of companies like Microsoft, Sony, Kobo, and many others. And through her career, she's been recognized for her work including being named a top 30 under 30 by the marketing magazine. Today, she runs her boutique marketing agency out of Toronto called Prosh Marketing, and she's an official member of the Forbes Communication Council. Please welcome Roshni Vijaya Sinha. Thanks so much for having me, Vlad. Roshni, thanks for taking the time to speak with us. Obviously, you're an accomplished marketing professional, and now you've also been running your own business for the past little while. What has been the most rewarding to you so far in your career? I think in my career, the best part has been working with entrepreneurs and startups who really have a passion and dream to bring it to market. And so hearing about their passion, how they started their company, and what problem they're trying to solve really intrigues me. And being able to provide real impact to these smaller companies has been something that's just been so special to me, especially because I came from an entrepreneurial family and a startup and a small business itself that grew over the years. And so as a family business, I got to see the impact that it had for my family. And I wanted to be able to help others kind of get that as well. So tell us a little bit about that origin story. Is that where you got your passion towards entrepreneurship? And when did that intersect with marketing? So it could be, I'm not exactly sure if that's exactly what propelled me, but my parents were entrepreneurs and I grew up in our family business. And I never grew up thinking I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I had a couple of different entrepreneurial adventures that were probably spurred by their enthusiasm and their belief in me. And so I started an art and piano school when I was younger that actually grew to be quite significant when I graduated school and I left for university Uh, and I had a good client base at that time. Then I went to marketing because I always knew I wanted to do something creative. And so I worked in-house at a number of different companies. And then I realized that in terms of my personality, I think I'm a person who likes to build things and to create things. And so uh, working in-house at some of these bigger companies, you would build, but there would be a limited amount of control and limited amount of things you would be able to do. And so wanting to break free and wanting to push the envelope, I realized that the only way to be able to do some of these things would be to start something of my own. And so that was kind of my path towards my entrepreneurial journey. So as you were working as an employee at different companies, you had a chance to work with some pretty big brands. And now as you have an agency of your own, you help not just the huge brands, right? But you also work with some startups and smaller size businesses. So how are you able to apply some of that big boy marketing, right, that you see at global brands and organizations and apply it to smaller budgets and newer companies? Yeah, so I think the funnel still applies from a large company to a small company. And so really understanding how do you leverage processes and systems and negotiate with vendors. And those are some of the things that I learned at Microsoft and at Sony and the bigger companies. And I've been able to take some of those creative ideas and apply them to smaller budgets because on a marketing side, there are three kind of levers. There's time, there's cost, and there's quality kind of in everything, really. And so if you're able to spend a little bit more time on things, if you're able to get junior talent, for example, who can get you to do some of these pieces, it might cost you less than a larger company. And also the level of quality might be different. You might be able to get away with a lower level of quality because you are a startup and you can just be more creative. And so using some of the same channels, techniques, and marketing programs that large companies have, smaller companies can tap into that, but also try to be just a little bit more creative in the way that they approach things so that they can make their dollar go further. 
So uh, one question that I think a lot of new companies have and business people that are starting out, especially ones that don't have a marketing background, a common question for them is, how much should I be spending on marketing? You know, where do I start? How do you usually answer something like that? Yeah, so there are two approaches to spending on marketing. One is affordability, which ends up being what a lot of people do. And it's how much can you just afford to spend on marketing right now? And that could be enough. Starting somewhere, you can just get some gains and then show some sort of return on investment. But the uh, better way to budget for marketing is to look at your overall costs. So if you're looking at your pricing structure and you have X percent of margin, then you look at that margin and you say, of that margin, how much would I be willing to give for a marketing lead? And so if I were to close someone, how much of that margin would I be willing to spend on marketing to close them? And then you look at your customer goals. So say you have 10,000 customers that you want to reach by the end of the year. You would multiply that 10,000 by the amount of margin that you'd be willing to spend for each customer. And that can give you a high level uh, idea of a marketing budget. What I would say is for companies who are just starting, you need to overinvest in marketing to get the ball running. And so some of these brand building activities are a little bit more expensive up front, but they pay off long term. And so you need to balance a bit of the quick wins with the long term strategic thinking so that you can go and build your marketing programs and scale up sustainably. That's really interesting. Uh, thinking about it in those ways. And when it comes to acquiring these new customers and getting that math right, a lot of times there's a lot of gray areas or kind of murky work waters, right? For people to understand clearly how much is it costing them. But it's very important to understand that I think what you, what you said about getting the ball rolling, especially in the beginning, there is a momentum factor involved with marketing as well, right? So it's uh, once you start investing into it, it takes a little bit of time sometimes to get the traction and then get that snowball effect. But once you do have it working in your favor, it, it becomes easier. To maintain as well. What about somebody who does possess a larger budget? You know, a company that really has a, a recurring year-over-year -year allocation towards marketing spend. Um, their revenue may be in millions of dollars. How would you approach uh, marketing budget allocation in those cases? So I would make sure that the company looks at a full funnel approach. I talk about this quite often because it's an easy trap for companies to always fall into the bottom part of the funnel where you can actually measure results and you know that their search intent or the intent for purchase is high. And so knowing that the intent for purchase is high, it's easy to spend on those customers because you know that you're probably going to convert them. But that becomes really expensive. And at the end of the day, you're going to tap out. There's going to be a limited amount of success you can get by only focusing on the bottom of the funnel. And so what I would recommend is making sure that you're allocating budget to different parts of the funnel. I would say at least 20% of your budget should go towards brand marketing, filling that top end of the funnel, getting awareness, because if someone's never heard of you, why would they even want to transact with you? And so making sure that they've heard about you, priming those availability pathways in their brain to say they've heard of you, they've seen you around, building that trust and credibility with that customer allows the bottom end of your funnel to be a lot more effective and actually can increase conversion rates later on. I think lifetime value of a customer is something a lot of brands struggle with. And partially it's because of availability of data, right? And also the quality of that data, because you have to look over a long period of time to really analyze the behavior of any particular customer. But lifetime value is so important when doing the forecasts and trying to uh, justify um, a budget investment or a marketing investment that's required to be made now, um, because we know that sometimes it takes a premium and you have to pay a premium to capture a brand new customer, right? somebody who doesn't know you yet, that may take a number of transactions to become profitable for you. What is your approach to lifetime value of customers and what is the easiest way to calculate the lifetime value of a customer? Ooh, tough question. Um, and there's, there's no real easy answer here, right? Like, but if you were to pick a starting point, right, somewhere to get started, let's say you do have some basic data, you're able to attribute your marketing channels towards customer behavior and you know how much they're spending with you and you're able to recognize that they spend with you multiple times a year, for example. Right. So where do you take it from here to take it one step further and go from, 
all right, this is how much this person bought from me in the past year to this is how much one net customer is actually worth to me over their lifetime. Yeah, so I think data is the first part of figuring that out. And if you have a CRM that's able to segment some of your customer bases, I would start with looking at different groups of customers and seeing what their purchase habits are. And some customers, you might have a great opportunity to upsell and cross-sell. And so they might be more valuable. Some customers might just be repeat customers that will come on a regular basis. So you want to start to categorize the customers in terms of their customer behavior once they become a customer, not just up until that transaction point. And with that data, you're able to see a couple of different segments and opportunities. And then based on that, you can probably take an average of what their average basket size is and get an idea of within a year, how much are they spending with you? And then you also want to take a look at how long do they stay a customer? So on average, how many years do they stick around for you? Certain companies like B2B SaaS companies also have different benchmarks that you can look up online, which will help you get a good idea of what your industry and what your vertical is actually doing on an industry average. Is there anything that you noticed uh, brand marketers and uh, marketing professionals in, de- in general, any mistakes that they make when they go about figuring out the marketing strategy? I think it's very easy to focus on the bottom of the funnel, as I've mentioned, and I see a lot of marketing funnels and marketing strategies that really just focus on the bottom end of the funnel, converting people and getting people who are already interested in the pipeline. And so I see those strategies as very costly and very risky as well, because they're very short term focused. And so you can do really well for a short period of time, but once you've tapped out Google, you've tapped Google and then the prices will go up. And so it's not necessarily a sustainable program or process. And so that's why I really recommend people look at an entire funnel, make sure that they're filling the top end of their funnel with people who have heard of them, awareness, PR, uh, social media. These can be easy tools for companies to use on the top end of the funnel that can be really cost effective and help you get better conversion rates on Google, get better conversion rates in your pipeline on your sales funnels. And so I think that's the biggest challenge I think that marketers face also is getting the dollars from the CEO to spend on the top end of the funnel. Because again, trying to justify the top end of the funnel, which is a lot harder to measure, It's a lot easier these days with digital marketing, but it's still harder to measure than the bottom end. It becomes harder to fight for those dollars and get budget to spend on that. And so I think it's a bit of a catch-22 situation. Uh, You've got to fight for it. At the same time, you've got to recognize that it is a long-term investment that will eventually bring down your overall costs of marketing. And it sounds like not investing into the top funnel of the customer journey will eventually cause the bottom part of the funnel to deteriorate and the performance to worsen. Is that right? That's exactly correct. Because at the end of the day, you're going to have to work harder on the bottom end of the funnel once you've hit up the low hanging fruit. And so now you've got to increase your spend to get the same amount because you've already gotten all of the people at that price range. And so if you're able to bring in new people and new customers to the funnel, you can still try the same tactics that are working on the bottom end of the funnel and just get better and more efficient. What would be some of your favorite brand marketing top funnel tactics versus acquisition, immediate action, bottom of the funnel tactics? I think PR is my favorite top of the funnel channel and tactic because it's got the broadest awareness. And so you can reach a number of targeted people at a quite affordable price per impression. Also, PR brings that credibility when a third party source or a publication is talking about you. It's not just you tooting your horn about your product or service. It's someone else doing that. And that becomes a lot more powerful to a reader. And then you're also able through PR to tell stories and get more than just a landing page and copy. And so when you tell a story, you're able to emotionally connect with a customer. And once you've made that emotional connection, it's so much easier to sell to them. They might overlook some of your major flaws as well, but if you've connected with them on a pain point on the top end of the funnel, it just makes them so much more loyal to your company and brand. And then another favorite kind of top of the funnel tactic is influencer marketing. And so I think a lot of people think about influencers as fashion bloggers with 100,000 followers on their Instagram. 
Uh, but I think influencers can be also really powerful on the B2B side. And we used to call them key opinion leaders, but you can think about influencers within any industry as someone who has a certain group or audience who has specific leverage or power based on their position in the industry. And having them as a third party credible source talking about your product or service and sharing about it can be ultra powerful to convince customers as well. So PR is a really fascinating subject to me because it's one of those marketing initiatives that is can be very subjective, right? People might have different understandings of even what PR means. The budgets can be totally different. Some marketing strategists have a very conscious effort on PR and, and others just kind of let it happen and hope for the best. But how have you seen PR change over the past decade? And what does it mean today in 2021? to have a PR strategy? What are you actually doing for your business? It has changed quite significantly in the last few years specifically. I think PR used to be thought of as media relations alone. And so getting an article on a major publication was what PR used to be. And I think PR has now grown into a more broad sense of general public relations. How do you reach a mass audience and tell your story? So PR now includes thought leadership, like speaking at events and conferences, for example, on the B2B side. It also includes getting awards and getting recognition for the work that you're doing. Uh, it, of course, involves media relations as well. But there's also grassroots marketing that you could look at. So, for example, you could do a PR stunt where you're involving a ton of your target audience and then calling media to it. You could do more activations like events, uh, like holding your own multi-day summit, for example. And so PR now is not just media relations. It's looking at multiple different channels and tactics to bring in a large amount of people with content that is topical, that is interesting to your target audience, and that showcases your area of expertise. And that way, it makes people interested in your company and your products and services. That's amazing. And just like media relations has kind of blended with public relations, just like you said, I find that a lot of times business brands are also merging with sometimes their founders' personal brands. And you see a lot of that happening. And that has an extension onto PR as well, right? So if you are a founder, then you also are a personal brand, not just your company is a brand of its own. And you could be recognized for something. You could be participating. And in fact, you are an official member of the Forbes Communication Council. Can you speak about right. personal brands versus business brands and the importance of personal branding on PR and marketing? Yeah, I think the founders and the leaders of a company can be very powerful advocates for your company. And so specifically in service-based companies, you're selling a service which is very tied to the people. And so it's important that people trust that person and can understand their expertise. And so what better way to show that expertise than speaking at conferences and doing some thought leadership activities or commenting on articles that are talking about topical things in your industry? And so especially from a service-based company, the personal brands of your leaders become really important. And even in a product-based company, you start to think about partnerships, sales opportunities, and those become even stickier if you're able to get people to understand your area of expertise. And so even on a product-based company, having a CEO who builds a personal brand can attract other companies to work with you. They can also attract talent uh, and top up other top leaders. And so it's so important that everyone on a leadership level starts to think about their personal brand, how they're engaging with the audience, and whether that's using LinkedIn, it could be writing for different publications, it could be creating your own blog, you could even create your own podcast. Um, but all of these things are great ways for you to showcase your areas of expertise. So you're a great example of being able to multitask in, in some ways and find time to attend to these different projects. How are you able to manage your time as a marketer, as a entrepreneur, as somebody who runs a business, as a fractional CMO, right? as a writer for Forbes Communication Council? What is your secret? How do you go about your day? And how are you able to do all those things and not let them drop? I wouldn't say that there's a magic secret. I would say it's definitely hard work and perseverance for sure. It's 
working multiple hours in a day and stretching your day out. There are still a finite amount of hours to get stuff done, but also working with as many people to outsource what you can outsource. So if I can think of my time as an hourly rate of X, then is my time worth doing X task? Then you can make a difference and make it educated decision based on if these are the tasks that need to be done, can I pay someone $100 an hour less to get that work done? Or do I need to do that work myself? And so that's how I try to think of these things. In terms of speaking and thought leadership, it is a lot of work and investment. And that's something that I think people just have to be aware of upfront. And it's not something that can often be delegated because you have to be that voice. You have to speak and you have to create your key messages. You can get people to prep you for the interview opportunities and things like that, but ultimately it's you and your time. What I would recommend is dedicating a certain amount of time monthly uh, and putting that aside for applying to these speaking opportunities, finding time to write content, and making it a regular part of your schedule because otherwise you can get bogged down in the day-to-day and it will never get done. And so I know when I have like a deadline for Forbes, I will make sure I put it in my calendar and block off that time to actually just get it done and then prioritize some other work. Can you talk about the purpose of the Forbes Communication Council and what does that mean for you to be a member of it? So the purpose of the Forbes Communication Council is to bring together thought leaders in the communications, marketing and PR industries and allow us to share our knowledge through content on Forbes publication. And so what that entails is we work on articles, we answer um, topical questions and do roundup posts. And then we also have a forum and a community where we come together and theorize and talk about different changes in the market and what's going on. And so we can help each other understand those and see what kind of things can we do to grow the industry as well. So you must have had, for sure, you've had a lot of exposure to all the latest trends, all the hottest things that are happening in the marketing world, in the in the business world as well. Is there a topic that you've worked on recently that you feel is really, really important, but is somewhat overlooked by the marketing industry? I wouldn't say overlooked, but I think that marketing technology is still an area that a lot of uh, marketers are still not fully embracing. There are just so many opportunities from an AI perspective, for example, to review your copy and get the best converting copy based on actual algorithms and actual results. There are programs that allow you to run your digital ads and have experts look at them as opposed to experts having to spend their time just running the ads and doing the base level stuff. There's marketing automation, which I think has just been scratched on the surface. And there's so many opportunities with marketing automation that I think people are just starting to take advantage of, but haven't necessarily tapped into that. And I think just on the whole, the space of marketing technology has just expanded significantly. And I don't know that all marketers have access to what's the latest that's going on, or that are able to kind of keep up with those as well as kind of running their own marketing teams. And so I think just as a business person and as a marketer, you have to have two hats. You have your operations hat, which is you're always on, and then you have your forward thinking hat, which is how do you grow and how do you improve? And so splitting your brain and your time that way can also allow you to make sure that you're not just focused on just getting through the next day as much as Uh, You probably just need to get stuff done. And that way you can help also look strategically and look more into the future as well and leverage some of these crazy tools that will actually help you and improve your performance. I think splitting your brain into different functions is so key, right? And it's almost necessary. And when you look at business, when you look at marketing, even it requires a certain level of creativity, out of the box thinking, novel approaches and sort of looking beyond what's readily available. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's very similar to different forms of art. And I have this theory that if you are involved in any kind of art, even if it's just like as a hobby, but you have that outlet to think outside the box creatively, to start with a blank slate and a blank canvas once in a while, that you can pick up things and that can translate into the business world and make you better at what you do professionally. You as an artist, and you've, you've done lots of amazing street art and Roshni's art, at Roshni's art is a super fun profile on Instagram where you post pictures of some of the work you've done. 
have you found that your passion for art and the time that you spend working on it has translated in any way and helped you improve as an entrepreneur, as a businesswoman, and as a marketer? A hundred percent. I think art is for sure, for me, a great outlet for me to be able to just open up my mind and not necessarily focus on one specific thing. And by opening up my mind, I'm able to absorb a lot more or recognize certain ideas in my head that might come together. And so being able to pull together a whole bunch of different ideas in a piece of art or being able to pull together a whole bunch of ideas uh, and put it into a marketing plan is a bit similar because you come with a whole bunch of different things that are all coming on at the same time. And how do you synthesize these things? How do you prioritize these things? And how do you also think about things differently than your competitors? In a marketing space, there are pretty much a finite amount of things you can do, but how you do them can be totally different and unique. And that's so important, especially with startups and small businesses. And I definitely think the creativity side has helped. I also think that from a visual perspective, like obviously marketing is quite a visually impactful medium. And so it's important that, you know, you have a good eye for design. You start to think about how do people consume what you're giving? And so as an artist, when you paint, you're also thinking, how is my audience absorbing this painting? And so in the same way, when you create copy or create any sort of uh, website or collateral, you have to think now, how is your audience absorbing this? What is the user experience? How do they go through all of these pieces and synthesize it in their head? And at the end of the day, what is the message that they're left with? A lot of conceptual art starts off with a concept that you're trying to communicate through the visual art or through your music or through whatever art form. And in the same way in marketing, you think of a concept that you have to communicate to an audience with your own style and brand so that if your signature wasn't on there, they would still recognize that that's a Roshni painting. And so in the same way, you want to make sure that you're able to kind of get your message across in a similar way that if you were to take your brand off the ad itself, you would still recognize who that company is. That's so fun. What kind, what kind of art do you like working on the most? Right now, I'm really into digital art. I got myself an iPad over Christmas, and I've been loving Procreate, mostly because there's no giant mess in my condo. Um, but I also really like street art because there's a great public feeling to that, and you get to work with other people. You get to involve the community, so people are passing by and giving their opinions and ideas and enjoying it as you go. Whereas, you know, if I'm painting in studio at home, I don't necessarily get that human interaction. Have you been following the NFT trend? And as a digital artist, what is your view on NFTs? I have definitely been following the NFT trend. And I think that it is a super cool way to now start to monetize and protect artists, as well as an interesting way to look at assets. And so I think that the creation of these NFTs has given just so much more power to a digital artist whose work could just be ripped off in the past, where uh, you could just take someone's print and just reprint it a ton of times. And there's no real recourse or no real way to kind of follow that around. And so I think that's one great thing from a protection perspective. But I also think it's interesting from a value perspective, because just because it's a digital piece, it, is it really worth less than a physical piece? And so that has been like a big debate in the old art world. And it's great to see that art is now becoming more progressive, even with like stuff that Banksy has been doing in terms of trying to change the traditional art view on what is worth money. Uh, it has been really interesting to see how the art field has just kind of evolved. Well, and listen, people buy baseball cards, people buy toys and figurines for because they feel that it's a form of art as well and it's something in many cases that people will, will only grow in value and in fact i was just re recently reading an article by erin uh, burry you may know her she was on a yeah. few of the same circles as you over her career as a marketer she's a friend of the show she was on the show as well but nice. she, i was reading an article that she was writing about protecting your digital assets when you die and essentially when people are doing their estate planning and wills and things like that they're we have to now start putting digital assets and accounting for them as well, because in many cases, they may not be as valuable now, but, you know, 10, 20 years from now, these things may be incredibly valuable. And we need to start thinking about protecting our digital assets, let alone thinking about understanding how they're created, how that works. So have you made 
an NFT already? I haven't as of yet, but I've signed up to a couple of different platforms. And so uh, I'm still exploring the space before I start to put my work into it. Well, if you're making like a limited edition um, NFT or, or, some, or one of your pieces of art, make sure to let me know. Okay, I want to be one of the ones who gets it. All right, I'm yeah, going to start sure. my collection. Nice. <laughs> I've been thinking of starting an NFT collection, but I don't know what to start with. And all the, you know, like... There's the guys in, in baseball caps. There is these pixelated characters. There, there's just so much stuff. Pringles, Pringles just came out with an NFT, uh, a group of 50. It's this little kind of card with a golden Pringles box. <laughs> it looks like Offer. a cryptocurrency. Yeah, so brands are getting on top of this thing as well. Let me ask you, Roshni, what are you seeing as some of the top marketing trends that are coming up? I think the local trend or the trend towards small business is something that is just taking over, especially through COVID. People have really started to support the small guys and the little guys as opposed to going to the big box retailers and thinking about their local businesses, their neighbors who are running these companies. And I think that has just brought awareness into that space of buying local and helping out small businesses. And I think that's something that's going to accelerate and continue to accelerate throughout the world, not just in North America. So if you are a local business, then this would be uh, hopefully a time that you can ride that wave a little bit, right? Is there, is there anything that business owners should be doing to make sure that they are uh, seen and they get some exposure as a local business? Like, is there anything like that out there? Yeah, I would say connect with your local community and make them advocates for your products and services, because I think at that point, word of mouth and referrals are ultra powerful in the local business community. And so finding ways to reach out to your existing customers and asking them for referrals, maybe there's even some softwares and programs that you can tap into that allow you to look at people who have transacted with you in the past, and then you even sending them a special offer just making sure that you're engaging people who have already shown you support and leveraging them to get the word out can be super strong and powerful. And then again, on the PR side, getting out in front of some of these stories and talking about what you're doing for the community, how you make a difference in the community. Maybe it's the fact that you employ 20 local people and that, you know, it serves 20 families that you're helping to feed. And so tapping into that local perspective and that local positioning can, I think, make you a lot more attractive these days. And I think there's even some media companies and radio stations that have now a section on their site that lists some of the local businesses and allows businesses to basically just submit their information and apply to be listed there uh, for free because, again, they're just trying to do their part in um, you know, supporting local. Have you had recently... Uh, experiences with everything that's been going on in the world and so many businesses haven't had to adapt their strategies. Have you had businesses come to you and say, uh, Roshni, this is our company. So far, we've been maybe not ignoring digital, but not focusing on it because it, we weren't really required to, but now we have no choice but to put more emphasis on it. Can you help us uh, become more digital, have a bit of a transformation in how we deal with customers how we even approach things operationally and from a marketing point of view. Have you had these types of clients over the past 12, um, 16 months? And what do you usually say to them? How do you go about that project? Yeah, so I've had a couple of different projects that have come my way this past year where companies have just had to pivot. And so what was working yesterday is not working in the new landscape because of distribution issues, because of marketing issues, or even maybe product and supply. And so they've had to reinvent themselves from maybe what they were doing into changing their products and services to be able to reach customers and to deliver it in a way that is now acceptable within social distancing and the new, the new normal, as people put it. And so I think the first step is really looking within and figuring out what are your core strengths? Why are people coming to you and picking you? What are your advantages? What are the different resources that you have available, whether it's money, talent, location, et cetera? And then once you understand your resources and where you're coming from and your internal perspective, then looking at the market. How have customer moves changed? What are their changes in behavior? Uh, what are their changes in preferences? How could you reach them? And then once you kind of do that external analysis, you also want to look at competitors, how are they changing, et cetera. 
then you want to find how can you match up what the customers want with what you're able to deliver. And so sometimes it means pivoting your distribution channels to online. Sometimes it means changing up your products to actually be a digital solution as opposed to a physical solution. And so it could be a number of different things, but I think the big thing is looking at internally at your capabilities and what you're good at. And then that makes it easier to transition. You could look at the market first and then figure it out. But that way, if you look at the market first and now try to figure out how can I get there, it will be a harder process because you'll have to do more change for you to get to all of those pieces as opposed to leveraging just what you're good at, what's working, your infrastructure. And that way your pivot will be more successful and easier to accomplish. Interesting. And uh, have you found that they've been able to turn things around and sort of come out on the other side of it new and updated or refreshed in some ways so that they're able to thrive in the new environment? Some companies have definitely succeeded and actually found competitive advantages through this whole process. And so that's the best part of seeing that. And unfortunately, some companies haven't made it. We all know that startups have about a 50% chance of failure. Uh, So the chances of failure are quite high. And I think some of them have not had enough capitalization to keep them going through the pandemic. And so even if you were able to rebrand and reshift and now get into uh, a whole new market, you might not have the money to now execute and implement. And so the companies that had enough capitalization at the start of the pandemic were able to kind of get through. But those who had to go seek out additional resources during the pandemic had a much harder time getting investors on board, for example, uh, because everyone was holding back their money. You mentioned that it can be difficult sometimes for startups to get through, especially the first one to two years because of the operating costs, because for most businesses, it takes time for them to become profitable, kind of even get to a break-even point. And of course, access to capital is very, very important as a key to sustaining and growth. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else out there that business owners and new entrepreneurs should really think about ahead of time to increase their chances of getting past that first very difficult period? I think people is the number one strategy. And I would say hire really good people. Don't necessarily cheap out on talent at the start. And the reason I say that is these people could grow with you in the future. People could make you more efficient in your spend, for example. And so they could be even more valuable than the money you have. And so investing at the start in really smart people can be the best strategy for growth and the best strategy to keep going because They might have resources, they might have connections, they might have the skills that might be able to fill other pieces. And so if you're able to find really smart people who are committed, who fit your corporate values, I would say don't cheap out on them and go after a strong talent pool at the start. And you don't have to have tons of people, but having the right smart people can just get you there. I think when it comes to hiring people and growing a team, the one aspect of it that is really fascinating to me is the growth of the gig economy and how much that has changed the way that, first of all, we as people are able to sell our own talents and market ourselves, and two, how brands and HR managers are now able to be more flexible in their strategy for human resources. And the gig economy and hiring freelancers is no longer just the cheap solutions for new companies or for a small business owner that just needs a project type of work done. It's also for big brands. And in fact, there are now senior executive positions and there are now platforms and services that specialize in sourcing and hiring part-time senior executives for established brands. Uh And I believe you have some experience with that. Can you you talk about uh, fractional CMOs part-time executives and why they've become so popular, why are they so effective in helping companies grow and go the right course? For sure. This is another topic I'm super passionate about because we saw a huge gap in the industry, especially on the startup side and the small business side, where you were only able to really afford interns or really junior marketers. So you still needed to get to that next stage of your business. You needed to get to either series A, a seed investment, or just even grow to have more money to invest in marketing. But with a junior person and without the money, you're kind of stuck chicken or the egg. And so 
what we've created is a model where we are bringing in fractional head of marketings or fractional marketing directors into companies at a part-time rate. And therefore, you're able to access super high-level talent that is experienced and knowledge, even specifically within your industry or vertical. And that can help you, with, based on their experience, just get stuff up and running. And they can help mobilize your internal team. They can help you negotiate with vendors because they probably have preferred relationships with vendors. And they're basically able to get you up and running a lot faster, probably a lot cheaper long term. And at the end of the day, they help you build solid foundations with internal resources. Gone are the days of marketing consultants who just give you a marketing plan and bounce. And I think that was a big challenge with the industry. And I think it's evolved from the marketing consultant that gives you a marketing plan and says, you figure out how to do it, right. to a now a fractional CMO who comes out. We create the entire strategy, and then we work with you to actually implement it. And we don't want to bring on a junior person on our team and charge you $100 an hour for copywriting, for example. We mm -hmm. believe that that's something that you can do in-house and train individuals to grow with your company, learn about your brand. And these people eventually will be your next marketing managers, head of marketing. And so bringing them in early, training them, teaching the CEO also about how to look for marketing success. What are the KPIs you need to learn? How do you manage a head of marketing? How do you manage a marketing team? As a fractional CMO, you can go in there, train both the leader and the junior person, create the strategy, and do it part-time so that it's affordable for startups and smaller companies. So who are these fractional CMOs? Are they um, somebody who is, let's say, a past marketer that's worked with, with big brands and now is a consultant but is a very hands-on consultant that also oversees the execution of it? Like, who are these uh, these individuals? Yeah, so these individuals are people who have already run a marketing team or department in-house at either a startup or another large company. And so they have experience building a strategy, running the strategy, and implementing it as well. And so we work with a number of different consultants in a variety of different areas. And some of them, they do this full-time. And some of them, they do this part-time. And so this is a part-time thing. And that's how companies like smaller companies and startups are actually able to afford them because otherwise if they're billing their full hourly rates as their level of seniority expects and dictates, it becomes very expensive. But if this is a side project that they're doing for four to 12 hours a week, they can afford to take a lower hourly rate just for a fun project, something cool to add to their resume, something that's interesting to work on that's a passion point of theirs and project. So it allows kind of a win-win on both sides of the consultant as well as the small company as well. Right. And uh, for marketers especially, because it's, it's not a very rigid job, right? It has a lot of room for fluidity and creativity. So marketing in general is a role that where it's important for two sides to understand each other and sort of be on the same wavelength, even if it's not always defined by a very specific box, right, of what's included in the responsibilities. And I've heard you before speak about the importance of picking the right clients. And I think when people sometimes hear that, they may immediately think about it's all about the budgets. Like, you know, I'm only looking for clients within a certain budget range. But I feel like there is more to it than that. And it's not even just for business owners and marketing agencies picking the right clients for their business. But as a marketing professional, maybe you're trying to get into the industry or you're trying to uh, become a senior marketer at, at a company that you've always wanted to work at, there's also the matter of meshing with your employer, right? Because they are essentially your client as well. You just have a different working relationship with them. So can you speak about what that means and why is it important to uh, work with like-minded people or at least people that uh, have an understanding and a similar goal with you and uh, what does it mean to find the right client? And what happens when you don't do that? Yeah, I think finding the right client just really revolves around them, understanding the value that you bring to the table, understanding and appreciating that value, and also someone that you can actually help. Because even if the budgets are great, if it's not someone that you can legitimately help, you're just taking their money unethically. And so I think you really have to think about, can you help this person? Can you actually help them grow? 
And that now starts to look into, is the CEO open to change, for example? Are they willing to listen to new ideas? And those kind of questions start to come up when we start to talk to potential clients, because if you're a company that already thinks you're doing things great and you're not actually open to change, but you're being forced to bring in a consultant to look at things, it's a lot harder to move and change that person. And the value that we can bring is limited. And so we want to give our maximum impact to whatever clients we're able to get. And so that way, it's important that we find the right people that we can actually help and that will be able to move the needle. Well, especially because there's so many specializations within marketing. You can be really good at one side of it, but have very little experience with something else. So it's perfectly normal that sometimes you have a client that has very specific needs that maybe aren't the top of your wheelhouse. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a knock on you. It just means that you may not be the right approach for them and they're not for you, right? So there's nothing really wrong with that. But marketing and long-term client and vendor success is so much driven by relationships that if you're trying to just grab the budget or the offer that comes your way, but you're not uh, really able to provide that value that they need in exchange, you can ruin your reputation very quickly. And when your reputation isn't working for you, that's a very non-sustainable strategy. You're basically just going to evaporate very, very quickly. And it does a lot more harm than good. Yeah, I mean, there's a big challenge in the marketing industry, uh, which we call like the emperor's new clothes, where there are a ton of people who claim that they're experts and they claim that they're making a hundred thousand bucks a month on their coaching. And these are all smoke and mirrors. They're not necessarily true, but they're enticing customers and clients based on their imaginary success. And this is something that I recently unveiled and found out about. And it's really killing our marketing industry because now people will get a marketing consultant and be burned by them and therefore be a lot more hesitant in taking on a real partner with expertise. And so I just caution everyone who's listening, when you are looking for a marketing partner, look at like, what have you actually done in market? What projects have you done? Speak to some of their past clients and see what was the success and were they happy with them? Sometimes people kind of build themselves up through personal branding, uh, where you think that they're an expert, but if they've never done something in real life and only talked about it, it's very different. Well, and you know what, that danger is amplified by how we consume information these days. So if you go to a platform like TikTok, for example, or just some of the more snackable, which I really love, you know, I, I love spending time on TikTok, I find it super entertaining. But here's the thing, I also follow a lot of business type of content on there, marketing related content on there. And this is what I'm finding is that you see a lot of the gurus, right? And it's hard to tell who's a real guru, who's a fake guru, you know, what are they actually doing? A lot of them that claim having a lot of success is they're really just selling courses, which is, a, you know, it begs the question of why you're just selling courses. So you know, why don't you just tell people since you've built all these successful businesses. But mm -hmm. here's the thing. When you are, when you, let's say you are a marketing person or you're a new business owner, right? A younger generation, you use these platforms to, uh, and you're exposed to this type of content. What I'm finding is that when you look at a piece of content for just a minute, when you only have to listen to somebody for a minute, or let's say you are a very inexperienced financial or a marketing professional or marketing person who's trying to sell a course, and all you have to do is impress somebody for one minute, right? Uh, for 30 yeah. seconds even sometimes. Like I'll record my screen and I'll just flash a few messages about how here's a screenshot of me making 20,000 last month. Here is me setting up a Google Ads account. And here is me, uh, you know, um, sitting at my desk with a laptop. And I look like I know what I'm talking about. But that's an impression that's only been cast through a half a minute piece of content, right? Yeah. If you actually listen to a person speak for 20 minutes about a subject, you'll have a much different idea of, of this person's competency level, their experience if they are actually somebody who is able to articulate normally and has experience that might help you. It's not just flashy advertisement. But I think because in a way we're being trained and, uh, and to consume content in, in those really quick ways, which for some type of content is incredible, but for other things, it distorts the concept of credibility. It almost normalizes the fact that you don't need that additional due diligence to hire people and to evaluate talent. 
which is, I think, a great pitfall and it's a great danger. Um, and you need to be able to separate those and reach out for those references, you know, ask the hard questions and like understand what that person is because the only reason to hire somebody is, is to grow with them, have them grow with you, invest money into them, right? And you need to approach those decisions very seriously. Those are serious financial moves that you're making for your business. Yeah. If with your career, obviously, you've made a lot of decisions over the course uh, as, of your career as a marketer, as an entrepreneur, as a successful businesswoman, as a, an artist as well. Is there something that you would have done differently if you were to start your business from scratch or if you were even going back entering the marketing industry for the first time? Is there something you would have done differently now that you've accumulated this experience? Sure. I think my recommendation, especially for the Canadian entrepreneurs who are listening, is incorporate as fast as you can and separate your personal revenue from your business revenue, especially if you think you're going to be successful. At first, I started as a sole proprietor and I got taxed like crazy. And so I think if you're able to start incorporating and separate out that revenue and do some proper tax planning, you can save yourself a significant chunk of change and just be smart about your financial planning. And I would say involve an accountant earlier rather than later. And it's worth the investment to really do proper tax planning, because especially in Canada, where tax rates are really high, um, you want to make sure that you're thinking about what is the best way to optimize all of that planning and tax and expense. People don't realize a lot of times, but the world is really built for people with salaries, regardless of what you want to do, right? So for a lot of entrepreneurs, I think that we're all so focused on, on the idea of how we're going to go out there, how we're going to sell and things like that. But it's that unexciting technical stuff that you really have to pay attention to because that stuff can really kill you, right? So uh, thanks for that piece of information. Do you have any other money tips for business owners? Yeah, I think cash planning is something that's super important. And I would say if you're a service-based company, try to get deposits or some sort of retainer upfront. And so especially when you're working with smaller companies, cash flow and getting them to actually pay on time can be challenging. And so if you're able to at least get a deposit that covers your fixed fees up front, then you're not going to lose money. And so that way you can pay your vendors on time. You can maintain good supplier relationships. But if you don't, you risk at the end of the service that you're now waiting a couple of weeks or months to get that payment through. And then you're in a cash negative situation. And so deposits are so valuable up front. Really, really valuable piece of advice. Rashni, um, I don't have any more questions for you. I, I really want to thank you for taking the time to speak with me today, for sharing your insights, uh, for sharing with us the lessons that you've learned along your career as an entrepreneur, as a marketer. This is uh, will be very, very valuable to all of our viewers. If people want to learn more about you, about your work, the projects that you're involved in, what's the best way for them to do that? You can look me up on LinkedIn. Uh, my name is Roshni Wajaya Sinha, or you can find more information about Prosh Marketing at www.proshmarketing.com, or you can follow along my artistic journey at Roshni's Art on Instagram as well. Amazing. Thank you very much once again for joining us today. I want to wish you the best of luck and have a great rest of the day today. Thanks so much, Vlad.